Hi, I'm Alex L., and I write books for a living. The Hey Girl podcast was created with sisterhood and storytelling in mind. Hey girl. Hey girl. Hey girl. Hey girl. (laughs) I'll be sitting down with some phenomenal women to discuss love. I believe we grew distant out of love of some type. Like, I don't want to hurt you. Loss. Really don't know what's going to trigger that feeling of grief in any moment. And a topic very important to my work, self-care. Freedom is self-care. It's not about pedicures. It's not about clothing. It's not about trips. Join us as we journey through sharing together. Today, I'm sitting down with one of my friends, Mari Andrew. She's an artist, illustrator, author, and just an all-around awesome woman. I'm honored to be able to sit and chat with her about her new book, the evolution through healing, loss, and grief, and how art has played a role in building community in her life. This is Mari's story. Hey, girl. Hey, girl. Mari, it's so good to have you on the show. Thank you for being with me. How are you? I'm well. It's so good to hear from you. We are friends IRL, so this is really fun. I know. (laughs) This is very fun. Um, So, okay, so I know you and all your great offerings and just how kick ass you are. But for those listeners who are not familiar with you, please let us know who you are and what you do. Ooh, good question. I feel like I'm always answering it a different way. Um, I'm an illustrator. Um, According to the internet, I sort of identify as a writer. I've been writing for a long time. I just published a book. But um, what I do mostly is express um, what's going on in my life and what's going on in my heart and my brain through illustrations on Instagram. I absolutely love seeing the transformation and the growth, Mari. It is just beyond amazing. Um, Before we dive into our true conversation, how did you get started with sharing your illustrations online? You are almost at 1 million followers on Instagram, which is just (laughs) wild that your work is reaching people and resonating um, near and far. How did you get started with sharing and why did you decide to share your illustrations online? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's so humbling and crazy. I never meant for anyone to see it. It was totally a practice of self-care during a tough time. Only two and a half years ago, I started when I was 28. So I feel, I don't think 28 is old, but I think it's a little late to start a brand new hobby that you've never even thought about before. Mm -hmm. And that came from, um, I've always been creative, always been a writer. I've always expressed myself in a lot of different ways. But when I was going through a period of grief, loss, Um, health issues, depression, I didn't have the mental space or the energy to sit down and write essays like I usually do. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to start expressing myself through little drawings. Um, When you are, when I was depressed, I found it to be way too much energy to do my usual forms of expression, including dance and all the other things that I like to do. And so this was something I could do every day that was so simple and easy and helped me kind of contextualize my feelings. I started the account just to put all my stuff in one place, never expected anyone to find it. Even my friends, it took me a while to tell them that I had this going on, this little project started. And then people I didn't know started connecting, which was <laughs> so incredible. I mean, it's crazy. It's it's a wild feeling and it's wonderful. It's so amazing how our traumas and griefs and just the hard things that we're walking through can transform into art. And I really loved how you say that you identify as a writer, but it was really hard for you to kind of sit down and get those long pieces out. So you found a new way to channel your creativity and your voice. So I can resonate with that 100% because there was a time where and during my pregnancy, so a recent time, where I just couldn't sit down and like write a poem or write a long essay or just really pour myself out on paper like I normally do. So I started my affirmations and that is really how I was able to bloom in that process. So I think it's amazing to hear you say you had to find a different outlet to get your voice out and your work, Mari, it is 
just so it's simple your illustrations and the commentary that goes along but so deep at the same time <laughs> like I read them and I'm like damn it like yes <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it takes one to know what I feel the same about your work, but I do love um, that idea that, you know, we can evolve and especially in our expression, because it sort of seems like there's one way that we're always going to do it right. and then it does change over time. Right. Um, I always tell people, you know, when you're going through trauma, loss, um, just a little heartbreak, whatever, you you are a new person. You are a transformed person. Mm -hmm. That pain makes you into a new person. And so the old rules don't always apply. You right. know, the, the stuff that you used to do to express yourself or be creative, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's hard getting back into that space. And you might, you know, get back there over time, but it's going to look different because you're a new person. And I think that's one of the frustrating things about going through any kind of pain and suffering is that you think, why am I not my old self? Why am mm. I, when am I going to get my old self back? And you probably won't. won't. Right. Right. Um, but you can find yourself in a new way. Absolutely. So do you remember your first illustration and you know, how that, how it coming to fruition made you feel and where were you in that time? If you don't mind diving a little deeper and talking about the emotional side of the transformation like where were you when you were like I need to get this out and this is how I can do it yeah of course so my earliest ones are just little drawings of objects because I didn't know how to draw <laughs> I mean I still don't really but I, I I had never really done it before I thought that art visual art was not for me I thought that I actually wasn't good enough at art to make it, right. <laughs> which is such a lie we tell ourselves. You know, right. it's like people tell me, oh, I'm not a writer, so I can't start writing. It's like, you know, a great way to become a writer. <laughs> you, you just do it. Right. Um, but I hadn't really drawn before. So what I was doing is using this new hobby as a way to self-soothe. And this was during a time I had lost my father, um, who I was actually estranged from, but I think in a lot of ways that made it an even more complicated grieving process and a more intense one and very, very lonely and isolating because I couldn't really understand my own feelings. I also was dealing with a really traumatic and sudden heartbreak that I wasn't expecting at all. And I was blindsided by it and totally disoriented. I also had a couple minor health issues that just kept me at home for a while. And so I was dealing with all of this loss and grief while I had to be at home and staring at my walls in my apartment. Yeah. And I was looking around at my life. It's like so many things became clear at that time. I realized I wasn't working a fulfilling job. My apartment didn't look the way I wanted it to look. I'm, I'm really affected by aesthetics and beauty. I love to make things beautiful, but my apartment didn't reflect that at all. My job didn't reflect who I wanted to be. Mm. And I had lost these two really significant men in my life. And so I was in a place of a lot of reflection and realizing there's so much I want to be. There's so much I want to give. And I'm just not really working toward that right now. And so the first thing that I need to do is just bring myself some joy. I just need to, you know, infuse some curiosity into my life, some daily happiness, because right now I'm just sitting on the couch feeling sorry for myself yeah. and feeling really lonely. And I am totally isolating myself. I'm just exacerbating that feeling of being really lonely by just kind of not doing anything. Um, so I decided to look outward and I started taking guitar lessons. I started taking more dance classes. I decided to do yoga every day. And I decided, you know, I have all this um, watercolor paper and paints that I've been wanting to use forever. And why don't I just break them open? And mm. so I started drawing just little things that I, you know, like a, like a fall leaf or a little house that I saw just to kind of teach myself how to get into that, um, that habit. Yeah. And every day I do it around the same time. And then because I wasn't really doing a lot of writing, I realized, Oh, this could be a way to express myself. This could be a way to use all of that, um, 
creativity that sort of festered up and to begin telling my stories and to begin processing these really intense emotions and just kind of the funny things that happen to me on a given day. I can do this through drawing. And so when I started being more honest about my life and just the daily things that happened to me, people started really connecting and I was shocked. Mm. <laughs> I was totally shocked. But I mean, that's how we build community is when we find our truth and then we stand in it and share it. And you, it's so interesting who it can touch, who our truth can touch. And we're never alone in our struggles ever. So the fact that someone can see themselves through your writing, through your art, and through your story is just magnificent. And I know that must make you feel like, this is why I do what I do. This is why I share what I share. Oh, it's the best feeling. <laughs> but it's also a feeling that anyone can have. You yeah. Know, it's not. Yeah. I think that anytime someone is honest, someone will connect because yes. we're all so similar. We're all the same fabric. It's ridiculous. I remember one of the first strangers who really connected to my work was this, um, like really stereotypical, like cheerleader teenage girl who looked so popular and cool. And she wrote to me and she said, I love your drawings. I look forward to them every day. And this is so funny because I was always such a misfit in school. I never thought popular kids would like me. Mm. I always felt so different from everyone else. And here's this girl who looks like she has just like all the friends in the world and all the glory of being a teenager. And she's really connecting to me. And then I started hearing from working moms in India and 60 year old men in the UK and people who I would never expect to connect with. And it just made me realize we're, we are the same. <laughs> we're going through the same thing. We're going through the same things. I want to talk about um, how you find balance and self care through your art. You've touched on it a little bit, but I wonder, and I think a lot of people who use um, different platforms, we write books, we're, you know, having meet and greets, we're doing all these things, how we refill ourselves so we can give back to the community, so we can fill up the community around us. So I was wondering, how do you take time for you? Um, and, you know, you are an artist, you are an author, and you are giving a piece of yourself to the world in a sense. But when you're not yes. sharing certain things, how are you keeping some stuff to yourself? And what does that look like for you? Uh, that's such a good question because it's so essential. And it has been a big transition, I'm sure, for you too. Yeah. You make this work for yourself, and it's so honest, and it's so real for you, and it comes right from your heart. And then people start looking at it, and people... Um, project onto it, mm -hmm. you know, beautiful and critical things. And it has been quite a transition beginning to make this art for me and then realizing, wow, a lot of people are seeing this. I am a dancer. That's really important for me. I do it almost every day. And that's something that no one's ever going to see. Yeah. You know, it's like, that's a really big part of my life. And it's a way that I express myself and I'm creative. And I get so much out by dancing, so much anger, so much joy, so much sadness and gratitude. But that is just for me. Um, I do a lot of writing just for myself. And I also still do a lot of drawings that no one gets to see. And so I, at this point, I really do take a minute before I share anything. Mm. And I really think about how it feels to share it. Do, do I feel healed from this? Do I feel like if someone has an opinion on it, will it affect, you know, my, my perspective mm. on what I'm talking about? Mm. And I have to check in a lot more than I used to. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just keeping, keeping the sharing part, a uh, a part of my identity, but not my entire identity. So that is, you know, being creative in a lot of ways and doing paintings that are just for fun.
I really like how you said you have to do some self check-ins before you share your work. Um, Mm -hmm. I really loved the question, am I healed from this? Will I feel a way if somebody doesn't like this or or doesn't receive this well? I want to talk about the different voices that can kind of come into play. You know, of course, most people love the work, but then you have those few people who are just nasty, especially on social media, right? Yeah. How have you navigated that and stood tall in your truth and your self check-ins and not been swayed by, you know, the trolls or the naysayers? Mm -hmm. How has that been? I don't think I handle it well. I mean, (laughs) the thing is, you can't can't make really vulnerable, sensitive work and just shut off your sensitivity when it comes to people's opinions. Right. I've had to grow a lot. And the unfortunate thing is that when you do shut off your sensitivity to criticism, you also shut it off to um, gratitude and Mm. to people who are really connecting with it. You know, you kind of, if you say that one aspect of feedback is projection, then you say that the, the lovelier aspect of it is projection. So I've tried to remain pretty soft Um, I do, I mean, I, I do try to listen to people if there's actual criticism that will make me a better person and better artist. Um, but I also think a lot about the Brene Brown philosophy that if you're not in the arena with me, you know, you're, (laughs) I'm not listening to your opinion. And, um, that's something I think about a lot. Like if anyone puts their heart out to the world every day. Yeah. Um, I am very, very happy to connect with them and talk to them and listen to them. But if they're not, you know, you can you can project a lot. You can um, criticize a lot from the sidelines. But unless you're in the arena, you know, you don't really know what that's like. And it does. It's a constant evolution. It's um, there are times when I just stop reading any comments. Yeah. There are times when I feel really in a a very good and powerful place and I can engage a little more. There are times when it really just doesn't bother me at all. And, And I think at this point, you know, I've been doing it for so long. I've, I've found the things that really work for me. And one is making sure that I'm not looking to the internet to heal me in any way, which mm. honestly, I mean, it sounds so basic, but it's mm. as someone who expresses a lot from my heart, yeah. that's not totally intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. That is um, so powerful for you to say, because I think a lot of people Um, In this day and age of social media and like everything being so loud and at our fingertips and just comparative and look what she's doing, look what he's doing, look what they're doing, followers, likes, all of that is just (laughs) so noisy, right? Noisy, yes. How do we come back to ourselves and also realize that social media is a tool? I spoke with a guest, another artist, uh, a few episodes ago, and she said, social media is the tool, It is not the source. And I think when we um, decide to share and we decide to pour our hearts out through our art and then in turn give it to the masses, there has to be some sort of balance. And I like that you touch on, you know, you know, today I can probably take this on or today I can't take this on or I don't want to take this on. And I think that that balance is what keeps people sane. You know, it's really hard to be at the um, fingertips of hundreds of thousands of people. It's very yes. tricky, right? It's kind of strange when you think of it, too. It's, it's really weird. <laughs> yeah, I always really appreciate the compliments that I appreciate so much these days are thank you for putting yourself out there because it's brave. It's not easy. Yeah. And when someone acknowledges that, it means so much to me because it's not easy. I mean, I think that you and I are we are built to express and the way that we process things in our lives is through expression. So I am never going to be a person who um, can totally hold off from expressing certain feelings. I've got to get it out there. I've got to share it. And I hope that that will be a positive thing and help people feel less alone and help people feel understood. But it's not, not always, you know, easy for me to do. And it really means a lot when someone acknowledges the amount of bravery and 
kind of unseen strength that, that it takes to put yourself out there. It is, it is wild. It's a wild I'm so ride. grateful for it. But, <laughs> it is yeah. definitely a wild ride. There was a time recently where you were unable to draw. You were unable to use your hands. As someone who uses their hands for a living, not being able to use your hands and having to really stop everything and take care of yourself and heal and physical therapy and all of the things that you had to go through. What was that like when you didn't have access to your body in certain ways? It was, um, I mean, I, I can't even think of a word. It was so frustrating for one. I was temporarily paralyzed with a autoimmune disease for about a month, completely paralyzed. And then a few months of recovery where my mm. hands were very weak. Mm. And so not only was I not able to use my hands to write and draw and do these things that I feel like I'm made to do, but I also couldn't do the things that just help me experience life in order to write about it. Namely, walking around, exploring, yeah. being yeah. independent. My favorite thing to do in the world is walk around a city. I live in New York now. I take a long walk every morning. I love just seeing people and being with people and going into coffee shops and, you know, just going by myself to read somewhere. And I was completely dependent on other people. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't experience life the way that I had just cultivated, you know, my love for experiencing it. And so that was almost harder than not being able to use my hands. Yeah. But after a while, I did develop a bit more strength in my legs. I could walk around, I could experience life, but I couldn't express it. I couldn't express anything I was going through. It was so frustrating to draw because my hands were so weak and it would take so long. And um, I felt like, it felt like this is not what I'm for. Mm. Like, I felt like a bird whose wings were clipped. Like it was so, just frustrating to be trapped by my own body and not be able to do the things that help me be the fullest expression of myself. So during that time, um, like I referenced earlier, when you've gone through trauma or loss, and I was, you know, I had lost so much, I had lost so much of my ability at that point, you are a new person. And right. so even though I couldn't draw or write, I had to do something else to help myself be a, a fulfilled version of myself. It was really, really tough to not have these, these things that I've relied on for self-care for so long. I started drawing out of self-care right. and suddenly, you know, that was the tool that I developed to help myself through hard times. And now that tool wasn't available to me. And so I started, um, you know, recording voice memos in my phone and, I started reading a lot more. I was um, trying to learn new things and try to keep my mind sharp. I would talk a lot to a therapist and record what I was able to express in those moments because I was doing so little expression. And then once I got better and I was able to start drawing again, I felt like I had like six months worth of feelings to talk about. I remember the first time I was able to write again, it felt like those YouTube videos were like a cow who's been in the slaughterhouse is like released into a field and just like gallops around like smiling. I felt like this is what I made to do. Like myself has returned. It was amazing. <laughs> that sounds like a joy to be able to come joy. back to yourself. So you and I are both published with um, traditional publishers now, and we've had our mm -hmm. conversations about how that's been. And I want to know from you, how was it bringing your book to life and what it felt like when it was finally completed, especially since you identify first as a writer and a storyteller? Mm -hmm. How was that for you? Were you just beyond proud? <laughs> I was, I mean, as you know, getting a book into the world is a long 
process and it is complicated and there is so much that goes into it that I almost lost sight a couple times of how tremendous it was and how exciting. And um, I remember the day it was published, I had so much going on. I was kind of distracted. Um, but my agent told me, this is the day that your writing goes into the world. Mm. Like you've had this way to publish, you know, your drawings and your ideas and, you know, these little feelings, but your writing hasn't had a home yet. And today your writing has a home. And that meant so much to me. And um, it just felt beautiful to get to tell these stories that have been percolating for so long. And I remember, you know, through every time of great loss that I've had during grief, during heartbreak, during illness, um, during just, you know, feeling uncertain about my life. Yeah. I have just clung on to stories like stories are my life raft. I am so grateful to people who put their stories into the world. And especially when you have a book, you know, that you can hold, it's so different from holding your phone in bed, you know, when you have that book that is relatable and honest and it's someone's story, but you, you see yourself in it. That's just meant so much to me. And so the idea that I could potentially give that to someone else is like, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not even really able to process it. It's too much. (laughs) Isn't it wild? It's It's wild. It's the best. It's amazing. And to know that, you know, our books and our offerings are going to outlive us. They're going to outlive the internet. Mm. Most likely Mm. they're going to be on shelves for years and years to come. Our kids, kids can touch them. And it's just, Like there's something about a book and the pages and flipping through it and having your favorite book and those books that you continuously pick up and go back to that just makes the magic so much more tangible. Yeah. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I'm so, so grateful. And I feel like I'm making my, my childhood self proud, like my little my little nerd uh, <laughs> baby self. She's, I mean, she's pretty excited about it, which is a good feeling. I mean, you should be proud. New York Times bestseller. Like, <laughs> can we talk Thank about you. that? How, okay, <laughs> we're going to talk about that for five seconds. Where were you when you were number five on the New York Times bestseller list? Um, I was sitting on my couch at home, just taking a breath because book pub week was bonkers and I was exhausted out of my mind and I got a call from my agent and editor who were both crying which was so sweet and I think that I couldn't I couldn't even really process it like that was so good for me to watch it was really beautiful to be able to share something with them and see see their joy yeah I mean that's that's the best thing and that actually was more potent and powerful to me than my own my own experience which I don't I just don't even think I could process it I'm just so proud of you I'm so honored to know you and watch your growth and watch you touch lives through your art because as artists as writers as people in this work it is our duty to nestle into the hearts of people sweetly And you are doing that, Mari. Like, you are shining, girl. And I am just so honored to be able to witness this growth and blooming and, like, just rapid, um, I don't know, community building. Because that is what you're doing. You are building community, one illustration, one word, one book at a time. And it's just so beautiful for me to watch. Oh, Alex, you are my teacher. I appreciate that so much. I've seen you do it and you do it absolutely stunningly. And it is an honor to be in your presence online and offline. (laughs) On all the places, girl, all the places. Mm -hmm. So before we wrap up, I want you to tell your 13 year old self something that you wish you knew then that you know now. Mm. Hmm. Oh, gosh, I think about that girl all the time. She was so conflicted. I read journals I wrote back then, and they just break my heart because I truly thought there was something so wrong with me. I thought, 
why am I so different from other people? Why can't I just be like other people? And I would tell her that her sensitivity, her extreme sensitivity, which everyone told her was such a bad thing or to get over, was the best part of her and was going to serve her so well someday, not just in career, but you know, being empathetic to people, being able to walk with other people through their pain. And I just wish she had known that much, much, much earlier. It's beautiful. I think that's a good way to end. Thank you so much, Mari, for being with me today. I appreciate you and your time. Thank you, Alex. If people want to connect with you online, Mari, where can they find you? Uh, They can find me first and foremost on Instagram by Mari Andrew. And um, check out my book on my website by MariAndrew.com. Yay. Yay. The Hey Girl Podcast is a member of The District Productive. Produced by Paul, Woody Woodhall, and me, Alex L. Music by DC's own Kokai. Kokai.